Hello, my name is Dr. Tom Bryan. I'd like to do an examination of your joints, if that's okay. Okay. Can I ask you your name, please? Uh, I'm Luke. Luke, nice to meet you. Hi. Okay, so the first thing I'll do, Luke, is, uh, is just have a look at you and your surroundings. So just sit still there for a second. First, remember the general observations that apply to any system. Apply these specifically to the rheumatology exam. Is the patient well or unwell? Are they alert and awake or drowsy? Comment on whether the patient is overweight, cachectic, fluid overloaded or dehydrated. Comment on the patient's colour. Is the patient breathing comfortably or are they dyspneic? Note any obvious deformity in any of the patient's joints. Note any signs of steroid use. Note any rashes and describe briefly. A more detailed description can be given on closer inspection. Note any scars, especially around the joints. Look for equipment or devices that are attached to or surrounding the patient. Comment on any modified equipment such as cutlery or crockery, grippers or modified telephones. Note any mobility aids. Note the location of the patient. For example, they may be on a general ward or a high dependency unit. Note any signs around the bed. When performing a rheumatological examination, you must look, feel and move every joint. The first joints examined are the joints of the hands. On examination of the hands, consider the skin, joints, muscles and nails. When looking at the skin, remember the mnemonic EARS. This stands for erythema, atrophy, rashes and scars. Start by looking at the skin of the dorsum of the hands using the mnemonic ears. Then look at the palms. Next look at the joints for swelling and deformities. There are several joint deformities that may be seen in rheumatological disease. Be able to recognise these. Note any muscle wasting. Inspect the nails for spooning, splinter haemorrhages, onycholysis, pitting, ridging or discoloration. Next we move on to feel the joints. First feel for warmth over the joints by palpating with the backs of your fingers. Compare left and right. Okay, I'm just going to squeeze your joints between my fingers, just let me know if I'm hurting you at all. Next check each joint for tenderness by compressing each joint between the thumb and index finger with enough force to cause blanching of your own fingernail. Check each joint individually. Palpate the joints of the fingers from the sides. During palpation for tenderness, note any swelling over any of the joints. Finally, feel for any nodules around the joints or on the arms up as far as the elbows. So I'm just, I'm just going to move your hands through the normal range of motion. So if you could just lift your hand up again. Is that causing any pain or discomfort? No. no. Next, move the wrist joints passively through their normal range of motion by moving through flexion, extension, okay. radial and ulnar deviation. Move the joints of the fingers by fully flexing the fingers and then fully extending them. Check for volar subluxation at the metacarpophalangeal joints. Okay, so now I'll get you to move through the normal range of motion yourself. So Luke, could I get you to raise your hands and bend your wrists down like this? Next, test for active movement by asking the patient to move their wrists through their normal range of motion by moving through flexion, extension, radial and ulnar deviation. Ask the patient to form a fist and then fully extend their fingers. That's great. Now if I can get you to uh, make two thumbs up. Ask the patient to move their thumb through flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and opposition. And now if you could make a ring between your thumb and your index finger, and then your little finger, your ring finger, and your little finger. That's great. Okay, now I'm gonna get you to 
if you could just grip my fingers. To check for functional ability of the fingers, ask the patient to grip two of your fingers with each hand and squeeze. Ask the patient to pick up a pen and write their name. Ask them to do this or simulate it with both hands. Okay, that's great. I get to pick up this key now. Ask the patient to pick up a key and simulate turning it in a keyhole. Ask them to do this with both hands. That's great. And if you do that with the other hand then. Okay, perfect. Now, what I'll get you to do is, if you could, with your right hand, form a circle between your thumb and your index finger. Finally, check for strength of thumb opposition by asking the patient to form circles with their thumb and fingers. Interlock these with your own and try to pull through the ring formed by the patient. Don't even pull through. Don't even pull through. Don't even pull through. So next I'd like to get you to put your hands uh, like this. And I'm just going to tap over your wrists here. Do you feel any uh, any kind of tingling or anything like that or numbness? No. Going through your hand? No. Check for carpal tunnel syndrome by performing Tunnel's test, where you tap over the flexor retinaculum on each wrist. You can also perform Phelan's test by asking the patient to flex both wrists for 30 seconds. Either test, if positive, will result in paresthesia in the distribution of the median nerve. No. no. We'll just hold it there for a few seconds. Still feels okay, does it? Yes. Okay, you can take it down now. And I'll get you to leave your hands like this. So I'm just going to uh, immobilize your hand here. If you could just grip around my fingers. Check for trigger finger by placing fingers on the palm of the patient as they flex and extend their metacarpal phalangeal joints. If they have a trigger finger, tendon thickening jams the finger in flexion. Palpate the palmar fascia for thickened skin which is known as Duputrin's contracture. The palmar fascia collagen changes from type 1 to type 3, which is thicker and tethers to the flexor tendons, causing a fixed flexion deformity of the fingers. Test for this by doing a Houston tabletop test. That's perfect. Thank you. Right. That's great. I'm going to move on to the elbows now. For the elbows, consider the skin joints and muscles. When looking at the skin, remember the mnemonic ears. Next look at the elbow joints for swelling and deformity. Nodules may also be visible. Okay, have you any pain in your elbows? No. Nope. I'm just going to. Next we move on to feel the elbows. First feel for warmth with the backs of your fingers. Compare left and right. Next, check each joint for tenderness by compressing each elbow between your fingers. Palpate the medial and lateral epicondyles for tenderness. Note any swelling and the presence of any nodules. So I'll get you to move your elbows. i get you to uh, stretch them out like this. Next, move the elbow joints passively through their normal range of motion by moving through flexion, extension, pronation and supination. Test for active movement by asking the patient to move their elbows through the normal range of motion by moving through flexion, extension, pronation and supination. So Luke, could I get you to raise your left hand please? Okay, and could I get you to uh, push your hand up against my hand there? To check for lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, ask the patient to dorsiflex their wrist and especially their middle finger against resistance. This results in pain over the lateral epicondyle in tennis elbow. To check for medial epicondylitis or golfer's elbow, ask the patient to flex their wrist against resistance. This results in pain over the medial epicondyle in golfer's elbow. Against my hand. Any pain on the inside of your elbow? No. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So next, I'm going to focus on your shoulders. For this part, could I get you to take off your t-shirt, please? Sure. Position the patient initially sitting, but later standing with their arms, shoulders and torso fully exposed. Women may keep their bra on. Okay, 
I get you to put your hands kind of high on your hips there. On examination of the shoulder, consider the skin, joints and muscles. When looking at the skin, remember the mnemonic EARS, which stands for erythema, atrophy, rashes and scars. Look at the shoulder joints for swelling and deformity. Note any muscle wasting. Okay, look, I'm just going to feel around the joints in your shoulders. Next, we move on to feel the shoulder joints. This includes the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the acromium, the coracoid process, and around to the spine of the scapula. First, feel for warmth by palpating with the back of your fingers. Compare left and right. Next, check each joint for tenderness by compressing each of the above joints. During palpation for tenderness, note any swellings and the presence of any nodules. So Luke, could I get you to stand up please? Test for active movement by asking the patient to move their shoulders through their normal range of motion. Okay. Test shoulder abduction and external rotation by asking the patient to place their hands behind their head. Test shoulder internal rotation by asking the patient to place the dorsum of each hand on the opposite scapula. Okay, that's perfect. So um, I get you with each arm to go all the way up like that, straight out in front of you. Test flexion of the shoulder by asking the patient to lift each arm out in a straight line in front of them until their fingers are pointing at the ceiling. That's perfect. And now the first arm I get you to put your arm back as far as it'll go. Test extension of the shoulder by asking the patient to raise each arm back in a straight line as far as it'll go. Now I'll get you to swing your arm out as far as it'll go to the ceiling. Right, and with the other arm. Okay, perfect. And now can you bend your elbow like that? Can you push your arm out that way? Great, and now in this way. Great, and now do that with the other arm. And then keeping your elbow. Okay. Can I get you to put your elbow with their elbow bent at 90 degrees and tucked into their side, apply pressure to the lateral side of the forearm. Ask the patient to push against your hand. This tests external rotation against resistance. To put your elbow in there again. With their arm relaxed at their side, ask them to raise it out into abduction against resistance. This tests the ability to initiate abduction, which can be a problem in rotator cuff injuries. I guess to put your arm out like this. Ask the patient to abduct their shoulder by 90 degrees and resist as you press down on their arm. Ask the patient to raise each arm straight up in the air. Then slowly adduct each arm down to the side. This test for painful arc, seen on active adduction between 60 and 120 degrees in impingement. So look, now I'm going to have a closer look at your back. On examination of the back, consider the skin, joints and muscles. When looking at the skin, remember the mnemonic EARS, which stands for erythema, atrophy, rashes and scars. Look at the spine for swelling, deformity or asymmetry. Note any muscle wasting. Have you any pain anywhere in your back, Luke? No. I'm just going to put my hand down your spine. Next, we move on to feel down the vertebral column. First for warmth, by palpating with the back of the fingers. Then for tenderness, by palpating along the vertebral column from top to bottom. Any pain there anywhere? No. Okay, okay. All right, now I'm just gonna um, press on the muscles beside your spine. Palpate the major muscle groups of the back adjacent to the spine. In a patient complaining of fibromyalgia, palpate the relevant trigger points. Other side. Let me know if I'm hurting you at all. Test for active movement by asking the patient to move their back through the normal range of motion. I'm going to get you to go through the normal motions of the, of the back. So for the first one, what I'd like you to do is just 
lean forward and bend down as far as you can towards touching your toes. Test flexion of the spine by asking the patient to bend down and touch their toes without bending their knees. Okay, that's fine. You can stand up. And I'll get you to lean back as far as you can. Test extension by asking the patient to lean back as far as they can go. Place a hand behind them as support in case they lose balance. Slide your hand down your leg towards your knee as far as it'll go. Test for left and right lateral flexion by asking the patient to slide their hand down their leg as far as they can and then return to the starting position. Any pain there at all? No. Okay. And I'm just going to put my hands on your hips to stabilize them. I want you to twist as far as you can to the left. Finally, check for left and right rotation of the spine by asking the patient to rotate their body as far as they can to the left and right and back to the starting position while immobilizing their hips. So you're going to have to put a, little mar a couple of little marks on your back. Is that, is that okay? That's okay. Schober's test is done next. Locate the posterior superior iliac spines. At the point halfway between these, make a mark. Then make marks at 10 centimeters above and five centimeters below. So the distance between the two marks is 15 centimeters. Okay, Luke, uh, so what I need you to do now is measure the distance between these two marks again. The marks should move apart by more than five centimeters. If they do not, the patient may have ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. So look now if I can get you to stand against the wall like this. And if you could touch the back of your head off the wall. Perfect, thank you. Move the patient to the bed for the next part of this exam. For the next part of this examination, I'm gonna get you to lie down in the bed. So look, for this first test, I'd like to lift your leg straight up in the air. Uh, as far as it go, uh, with your knee, with your, with your knee extended. So, the straight leg raising test is done for sciatica. Raise each leg straight up in the air. Normal hip movement should allow for ninety degrees of flexion. If there is pain in the back of the leg, radiated to the lumbar spine, the test is positive for sciatica. Yeah. Okay. We'll just go up with the other one. Lasique's test for sciatica is the same as the straight leg raising test except that the ankle is also dorsiflexed during leg raising. All right. Um, now, can I get you to turn around your tummy? And using this leg, can you bring your heel up to your bum? The femoral nerve stretch test is done by flexing each knee as far as it will go with the patient in the prone position. In a positive test, the patient will feel pain in the anterior thigh on the same side, which is the distribution of the femoral nerve. Is on the left, no? Okay. Oh, great. So you can turn around to the lie on your back again. So I'm going to focus on your hips now. Um, can I just get you to expose them a little bit if you could just lift your t shirt up a bit? Position the patient lying supine on a flatbed with legs fully exposed. On examination of the hips, consider the skin, joints, and muscles. Look at the hips for swelling, deformity, or asymmetry. If any asymmetry is noted, measure the true length and apparent length of the legs. True length difference demonstrates hip disease on the shorter side. Apparent leg length differences demonstrate pelvic tilting. Note any muscle wasting around the legs. Palpation consists of locating the anterior superior iliac spine, the pubic tubercle, and from these the inguinal ligament. Palpate these landmarks and also the midpoint of the inguinal ligament for hernias. Locate and palpate the greater trochanters bilaterally. Passive movement of the hip is carried out with the patient initially lying supine. The first one is uh, flexion. So. Test for flexion by stabilizing the iliac crest with one hand and flexing the leg with the other hand. 
Bring each knee up to the chest, allowing the knee to flex at the same time. Test each leg. Right. Test for abduction and adduction by stabilizing the iliac crest with one hand and abducting the hip out as far as possible and then moving it back to the starting position. Test each leg. Back to me. Is that okay? It is. Test for internal and external rotation by flexing both the hip and knee 90 degrees and then moving the knee laterally for external rotation and medially for internal rotation. Test each leg. Okay. And I can I get you to turn around onto your toy. To test for extension, ask the patient to roll over into the prone position. Stabilize the pelvis with one hand over the sacroiliac joint. Extend the hip by raising the leg off the bed. Test each leg. I feel okay? That's good. Okay. All right, you can turn back around again. That's one of the tests I'd like to do. Could you bring both your knees up to your tummy? To check for a fixed flexion deformity, perform Thomas's test by flexing both hips fully. Then allow one leg to extend fully. Thomas test is positive if the patient cannot extend the leg fully. All right, so I'm just going to focus a little bit more on the knees now. On examination of the knees, look at the skin, joints and muscles. Look at the knees for swelling, deformity or asymmetry. Note any leg muscle wasting. Next, move on to feel the knees. Any pain around the knees? No. Feel for warmth with the back of your fingers. Compare left and right. Perform the patellar tap to check for moderate to large effusions around the knee. Okay. Now I'm going to move your knee through its range of motion. Passive movement of the knee is carried out with the patient lying supine. Check for flexion and extension of each knee. Okay, perfect. And can you do that yourself? Go through the same actions for active movement, Great. this time with the patient actively flexing and extending each knee. Right. So I'm going to check the stability around your knee, all the ligaments, starting with the cruciates. This I need to put your knee at this angle and stabilize your foot. Check for knee stability by testing the ligaments of the knee. The anterior drawer test tests for damage to the anterior cruciate ligament. Bend your knee up. The posterior drawer test tests for damage to the posterior cruciate ligament. Okay. So next I'm going to check for the collateral ligaments. Lift one of the patient's legs and hold the ankle between your elbow and side. Put a hand on either side of the patient's knee, keeping the knee straight. No. Okay. Apply lateral pressure to the knee to test the lateral collateral ligament and apply medial pressure to the knee to test the medial collateral ligament. Right. So I'm going to check for the menisci. Perform McMurray's test for meniscal damage. So could I get you to turn around onto your stomach then, please? Sure. Next, move the patient to the prone position. Thank you. Flex the knee to 90 degrees and perform Apley's grind test. Push down, so just let me know if you feel any pain. Test is positive if there's a click or popping of the knee, or this test induces pain. Repeat for both knees. 90 degrees, so this way. Any pain there? No. No. With the patient in the prone position, 
Examine the popliteal fossa. Check for the presence of a baker's cyst or a popliteal artery aneurysm. Okay, can you turn back around then onto your front? Or onto your back? I'm just going to focus now on your ankles. Is there any pain in your ankles? No. No. On examination of the ankles and feet, consider the skin, joints, muscles and nails. Remember the mnemonic EARS, which stands for erythema, atrophy, rash and scars. Look for the ankle joints and joints of the foot for swelling or deformities. Note any muscle wasting. Luke, do you have any pain in your feet? No. no. Next, we move on to feel the joints. First, feel for warmth over the joints by palpating with the back of your fingers. Compare left and right. Next, check each joint for tenderness by compressing each joint between the thumb and index finger with enough force to cause blanching of your own fingernail. Check each joint of the foot individually. Palpate the joints from the sides. During palpation for tenderness, note any swelling over any of the joints. Move the joints of the feet through their normal range of motion by moving the ankles through dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, the subtalar joints through inversion and eversion, and the interphalangeal joints through flexion and extension. Look, could I get you to go through those motions yourself uh, actively? So if you could... Uh, Next, test for active movement by asking the patient to move their ankles through dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Their subtalar joints through inversion and eversion and their interphalangeal joints through flexion and extension. Curl them up and splay them. Okay, that's everything. The last thing I'll get you to do is if you could stand up and you could walk to the end of the room. Assess the patient's gait from the perspective of balance, rate of walking, how they hold their arms and legs, presence of any recognizable gait disorders such as hemiplegia, spastic paraphesis, shuffling gait, ataxic gait, foot drop, Trendelenburg, or the waddling gait of proximal myopathy. Okay, that's everything, Luke. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doctor.